In the field of the arts worldwide, <clears throat> thousands of prizes are awarded each year. Within the economy of a given art, such prizes constitute a kind of currency with some prizes counting for more than others. Among the few prizes whose value is current outside their specific artistic economy are the Nobel Prizes. Why the Nobel Prizes have this lofty status is not obvious. It certainly helps that they have been around for a long time, that very large sums of money are attached to them, and that they are bestowed by the Swedish monarch in a picturesque ceremony. But this does not explain why, in the popular mind, they have become the ultimate accolade a scientist or author can receive. Let me try to situate the Nobel Prize for Literature in an historical context. Alfred Nobel died in 1896 at the age of 63, a very wealthy man. In his will, he funded five annual prizes. The prize for literature was to go to the person who, in the words of the will, I quote, shall have produced the most outstanding work in an ideal direction, unquote. The winner was to be decided by the Swedish Academy. The deliberations of the Swedish Academy take place in secret, but one can survive, surmise that the formula outstanding work in an ideal direction has caused the Academy headaches over the years. What exactly does ideal mean? Does it mean today what it meant in 1896? Are writers the direction of whose work is not ideal to be excluded from consideration? And what does it mean to talk about the direction of a body of work? Does every body of work have a direction? More broadly, how tightly is the Academy bound by the wording of a will that is well over a century old? Is the Academy not entitled to interpret its mandate in today's terms? Alfred Nobel was a more interesting person than one might at first expect. Besides his pioneering work in the chemistry of explosives, he had a strong interest in literature. He read widely in several languages. In his spare time, he wrote plays and novels, which, as far as I know, remain unpublished. The writer of his day, whom Nobel most detested, was Emile Zola. Zola, along with the naturalist school of writing that he fathered, was a Darwinian who believed that man's fate was determined by heredity and environment, over which the individual had no control. Nobel, in contrast, believed in progress and in the triumph of the individual human spirit. In particular, he believed it was the historical role of great men, great spirits, to show mankind the way to the future. The most gifted Swedish writer of Nobel's day was August Strindberg. In his youth, Strindberg was an enthusiastic follower of Zola. Nobel had no sympathy with Strindberg's work. <laughs> his favorite Swedish writer was the poet Victor Rydberg, now pretty much forgotten. As a writer and thinker, Nobel considered himself a follower of Rydberg. He described himself as, I quote, a super idealist, a kind of ungifted Rydberg, unquote. Strindberg died in 1912. Though it had 11 opportunities to do so from 1901 to 1911, the Swedish Academy never awarded the Nobel Prize to him. Among the lesser writers who did win the prize was the Swedish novelist Salma Lagerlöf, laureate in 1909, whom the Academy praised for her, I quote, lofty idealism, unquote. We get the picture. The Nobel laureates, at least in the early years of the prize, had to give voice to a worldview compatible with Alfred Nobel's. We come to the question of 
direction. The Swedish Academy is a venerable body self-elected from among the Swedish intellectual establishment. The Academy of 1896 probably had a good grasp of what Nobel meant when he wrote of literature of an ideal direction. Direction, or in German, Tendenz, was a key concept in the literary criticism of Nobel's day. The Tendenz of a work synthesized in a Hegelian sense all the elements of the work and thus epitomized its social and historical meaning. If we look at the citations that have accompanied some recent awards, we can detect a striving, if not to turn the laureates into secret idealists, at least to claim an idealistic tendency in their work. For confirmation, we have only to look at the eccentric citations that the Academy has provided for such dark-spirited writers as V.S. Naipaul, prize winner in 2001, or Elfrida Jelinek, prize winner in 2004. For reasons that are not always clear to outsiders, the Nobel Literature Prize became, during the 1980s, an issue of major importance in the intellectual life of the People's Republic. The Communist Party went so far as to advocate that winning the Literature Prize should become a national priority. Even though the 1990s saw official attention diminish, the question continued to simmer in public debate. Why? in the near 100 years of the prize had the Swedish Academy never awarded it to a Chinese author. The obsession with the literature prize was fed from two sources. One was a desire to assert China's rightful place on the world stage. The other, a troubling realization that to win this ultimate accolade, Chinese writers would have to meet ideologically alien standards the criteria of Alfred Nobel's will and of the Swedish Academy. It was the question of standards that made the Literature Prize a special case, different from the prizes in the sciences. Over the years, a number of ethnic Chinese scientists based in American universities have been prize winners. The Chinese authorities have had no difficulty in recognizing and applauding their achievements. In sharp contrast was their treatment of Gaoxing Yan, awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2000. We talked extensively about Gao in the first session this morning. Gao had left his homeland in 1987 to live in Europe. Though not politically active, he was never a friend or sympathizer of the regime. The award to Gao was attacked by the party as politically motivated an insult to China. Though Gao wrote in Chinese, he was labeled a French writer and effectively expelled from the Chinese canon. The Swedish Academy has never seen it as, as its duty to spell out its criteria. Indeed, it has been argued, for example, by Julia Lovell, that of late, the Academy has conveniently used one set of criteria for Western writers and another for non-Western writers. In the first case, Lovell suggests, a premium is placed on the writer's individuality, in the second, on the writer's cultural representativeness. Mo Yan, awarded the Nobel Prize in 2012, would be an instance of Lovell's second category. To further complicate the issue, one should not forget the Academy retains a certain residual duty to the terms of Alfred Nobel's will, even though of late these terms have been followed only half-heartedly. It is not unusual in the case of long-established literary prizes for the criteria set down by the founders to be overtaken by history, leaving juries in a more and more uneasy position. Should they tacitly modify the original criteria, 
Or should they interpret the founding document literally and run the risk of becoming antiquated or irrelevant? In the case of Alfred Nobel's will, the insistence on an idealistic, as opposed to what we may loosely call a realistic tendency, grew out of a debate in aesthetics that was central in the Europe of Nobel's day, but is no longer so. Even to Western candidates for the Literature Prize, the standards they are expected to meet must seem odd, and their tacit updating by the Swedish Academy obscure. It is not surprising that to writers from non-Western traditions, those standards should seem baffling. Thank you.